Hello investors and welcome to my YouTube channel where I study the best investors and businesses from around the world. In this week's video we'll go over the book Mastering the Market Cycle by Howard Marks. We will be taking a look at these three key topics. Number one, why investors should go against the financial tide. Number two, how the boom bust cycle works in practice. Number three, why does this boom bust cycle occur? Imagine you're a successful financial investor with your own capital management firm and more than 40 years in the market. What are the most common questions you'd expect your clients to ask you? The most common questions are about the market cycles. Clients want to know how to position themselves within the current market cycle, where they stand within it, and how it will play out more than anything else. Is the market performing well with prices rising or is it underperforming with prices falling? Today's video will attempt to answer such questions. Cycles, whether in a particular market or an entire economy, are the linchpin of superior investment performance. They are often underappreciated and understood. By the end of this video, you should have a better understanding of how they work and be that much closer to becoming a superior investor. For our first topic today, we will take a look at why investors should go against the financial tide. Let's begin with a simple question. What exactly is an investor? Well, there's someone whose job it is to invest in a variety of assets to make up a portfolio which they hope will appreciate in value over time. How do they determine which investments are likely to grow in value? Despite the fact that some guesses are more likely to be correct than others, an investor can never be certain of the outcome of an investment. All that they can do now is practice the art of making educated guesses. But mastering this art is no simple task. To begin with, it's nearly impossible to forecast the long term with greater accuracy than other investors. They are likely to be aware of impending large-scale economic, geopolitical, or market-related events such as wars, stock market crashes, or the introduction of new technologies, just as you are. Why? Because you and they are most likely reading the same articles and analyzing the same data. Their predictions about the future events will most likely be as accurate as yours. So don't bother with long-term forecasting. It's far better to focus on what the offer refers to as the knowable and make short-term predictions based on that knowledge. The knowable is all the information you can gather about an asset's true value. If you're thinking about investing in a company, for example, you should look at the real value of its assets and compare it to the price of the share at that company. You may be looking at a good investment if the price undervalues the real value. So the goal is straightforward. You want to buy assets when they are cheap and wait for market developments to raise their value. Consider the case where the real estate market has collapsed and developers have been forced to abandon their construction projects due to debt default. You might be able to snag up structures whose materials alone are worth more than the price you're paying. Obviously, doing so will increase the likelihood of your portfolio increasing in value in the future. Some investors believe that buying low and selling high is all there is to it. However, the superior investor should, and frequently does, consider a third factor, financial cycles. So what exactly is a cycle? Howard Marks defines it as a pattern that repeats itself. Cycles abound in the natural world. For example, day turns into night, which turns into day. Summer gives way to autumn, autumn to winter, and winter, in turn, gives way to spring. Fortunately for us, these natural cycles repeat themselves so frequently that we can plan our lives around them with such certainty that we can position ourselves advantageously within them. The cycles that markets and economies follow aren't nearly as predictable as the sun setting or the seasons changing. That isn't to say that they don't exist. Consider what would happen if the earth didn't orbit the sun at a predictable rate. 
its orbit would speed up and slow down at random intervals, and while it would always complete its orbit, there would be no way of knowing when day would turn into night or vice versa. Market cycles work in a similar way. It's impossible to predict when a positive market upturn will turn into a negative market downturn. In the long run, the pattern may be clear, but there is a lot of variation in the short term. As a result, we can't talk about economic or market cycles in terms of certainty. We can, however, talk about them in terms of tendencies. A tendency is anything that an informed investor believes is likely to happen, as well as their calculations about how likely it is. After a market boom when prices have risen to unsustainable levels and investor optimism is at an all-time high, there will, mo there will almost certainly be a bust. When prices fall precipitously and investors become fearful and depressed, when that bust will occur and how severe it will be are completely unpredictable, but that doesn't rule out the possibility of positioning an investor's portfolio to anticipate the bust in the event of a bubble. Secondly, we will take a look at how the boom-bust cycle works in practice. So how do market cycles usually behave? We can say of financial cyclicality what Mark Twain said of history, it doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. To put it another way, no two cycles are identical, but they all tend to follow the same repetitive pattern. This pattern is perhaps best illustrated by using an extreme example. The dot-com bubble and subsequent crash from 1995 to 2002, a boom-bust cycle fueled in large part by venture capitalists and experience. The popularity of the internet in the United States skyrocketed in the mid-1990s, heralding a slew of new business opportunities. Venture capitalists quickly began investing in online businesses, which sprang up like mushrooms despite the fact that the majority of them had little chance of becoming profitable. Stocks rose to unprecedented highs as a result of the frenzy, with venture capital funds reporting triple-digit returns. This attracted even more funding, and before long, there were far too many online businesses. There was a bubble forming. The majority of these businesses were doomed to fail. Many venture capital investors lost their entire investment and stock prices plummeted. If you graphed this event, it would look like a cathedral spire with a sharp increase in the venture capital investment starting in 1999, peaking in 2000, and then sharply decreasing later that year. Venture capital investment, on the other hand, has recovered to a large extent since then. Indeed, a graph shows that it has climbed back up to half of its previous height of 2000. In other words, the venture capital market has grown on average over the last 20 years, but there have been wild swings in the short term, with prices peaking in 2000 and dipping into a valley in 2002. In general, almost all markets, economies, and companies follow this pattern, albeit on a less extreme scale. They grow gradually, and on average, this average growth rate is known as secular growth rate, which, with secular referring to the fact that it has lasted for a long time. Growth, on the other hand, oscillates up and down around this secular trend in the short term. This leads us on to our final topic. Why does this occur? Emotional extremes are uncommon in day-to-day -day life. We all have bad days and good days, but most people don't experience unbridled euphoria and bottomless despair on a regular basis. So it may come as a surprise that human emotions, specifically a fluctuation between euphoria-driven greed and despair-driven fear, is one of the main causes of short-term market ups and downs. This is how it goes. Investors become delusional during periods of significant growth, such as the one spurned by venture capital between 1995 and 2000. They believe that the expansion will continue indefinitely. They tend to ignore the peak and valley pattern of previous cycles, either because they are 
too young to remember previous cycles, or because they're too confident in the potential of a new market, they euphorically claim that this time will be different. This euphoria then spreads, causing other investors to jump on board, even though prices have already surpassed the reasonable amount represented by the secular trend, investors continue to participate either because they're afraid of missing out on a boom or because they're unaware of the risk of a bust. Then, eventually, fear begins to take hold, investors recognize that prices may have risen too high and will likely fall in the near future. They start selling, lowering prices, and causing other investors to lose faith until everyone is selling and prices fall below the secular trend. It's difficult to avoid the herd mentality that a booming market induces. Even Isaac Newton, widely regarded as one of history's greatest geniuses, couldn't do it. Newton was serving as England's master of the mint in January 1720, so he wasn't unfamiliar with finance. The South Sea Company's stock was worth £128 at the time. However, the price began to rise after that. Newton wisely sold his £7,000 worth of stock when he realized the rise was being fueled by speculative investments. The impending cycle had been correctly predicted by him. Stock prices soared to 1050 in June before plummeting to be less than 200 by September. But here's the thing. There is a catch. Newton couldn't seem to keep his word. After seeing his peers make ridiculous amounts of money, he repurchased his stocks at the peak, only to lose everything more than 20,000 pounds in the subsequent crash. What is the takeaway here? When euphoric greed reigns supreme, it pays to resist the herd mentality that emerges, but it's just as important to fight despair-fueled fear. Countless investors watch the news every day, paying close attention to the ups and downs of this or that market. However, Few of them pay enough attention to what the data they gather says about their position in the current investment climate. The superior investor, on the other hand, devotes his full attention to these matters. This is completely reasonable. After all, when investors are euphoric and greedy, they lose faith in risk and continue to buy even when prices have reached absurdly high levels and the risk of a crash has increased dramatically. Returns on risky investments are also at a minimum during market upswings. Because everyone is ecstatically buying, sellers can demand high prices and offer pitiful risk premiums, increasing the risk of a loss even more. So proceed with caution if you hear things like, the market can't fail and this time it's different. On the other hand, when investors are depressed and fearful, such as after a market crash or slump, risk is at its lowest. All of the investors all of the investors who have lost money will be cautiously standing on the sidelines believing that the market has entered an inexorable downward spiral. However, risk premiums and the likelihood of a market upswing are at the highest at this point. In a nutshell, it's riskier to invest when investing is widely considered to be risk-free and it's also riskier to invest when investing is widely considered to be high risk. You should now have a basic understanding of short-term market cycles and the advantages of paying attention to your position within them. But what about long-term secular trend? Couldn't you just invest and let your money sit there if the secular growth rate is always positive? Allowing the short-term cycles to cancel each other out while you profit from the secular trend's gradual growth. The thing is, the secular trend goes through cycles as well, though they take a lot longer to play out. When you look at the long-term trend in the United States gross domestic product, or GDP, this becomes clear. Multiplying the number of hours worked in a country by the value of each hour's output is one way to calculate GDP. This means that a country can increase its GDP in one of two ways, by increasing the number of hours worked or by increasing the productivity per hour. 
The most obvious way to increase the number of hours worked in a country is to increase the number of workers, and indeed population growth is linked to increased GDP. The birth rate in the United States, for example, increased dramatically after World War II, a phenomenon known as the baby boom when the children born between the late 1940s and the early 1960s reached working age. The U.S. economy experienced significant growth simply because there were more people working. Economic growth resulted from the increase in working hours. The second long-term way to boost GDP is to increase productivity per hour, which is dependent on technology. For example, between the late 1700s and the early 1800s, steam and water-powered machines began to replace human workers in certain fields, allowing them to perform their jobs more efficiently. Meanwhile, work that had previously been done slowly in small shops began to be completed at breakneck speed in large factories. As a result, the economy has grown. GDP in the United States grows at a rate of 2 to 3 percent per year, but keep in mind that this is the average rate of growth. It doesn't rule out the possibility of long-term economic downturns, from which the economy could take years, if not decades, to recover. Birth rates can drop for a variety of reasons, including wars, unfavorable economic conditions, and social trends like young Americans' current proclivity to put off starting a family. In the long run, the resulting workforce reduction could lead to a broad economic downturn. In short, relying on bright future days that may never arrive is risky. As a result, the superior investor is always aware of short-term cycles and adjusts his position accordingly. This brings us to the conclusion of today's video. The cycles of markets, economies, and individual companies allow a particular pattern. In the long term, they tend to grow, following what's called a secular trend. However, they fluctuate a lot in the short term, oscillating around this secular trend. The superior investor is one who is aware of these cycles and adjusts his stance and portfolio positioning to take advantage of them. So my advice to you, the yearly investor, is read, 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 and read some more. In the financial world, many people are still trapped in a bubble. They only pay attention to news and financial reports, and they rarely read books that are not related to their field. Reading history books, or even novels, can teach you a lot about cycles. Consider the massive cycle that the Roman Empire went through. So don't limit yourself to a single genre, and Keep an eye out for lessons that can be applied to investing in life. Thank you for watching this video entirely to the end. Nothing helps me out more than y'all sticking it out to the end. Please consider subscribing to my channel if you haven't already done so. Also, if you enjoyed this video, please like this video and subscribe to my channel so that I can continue to make videos like this for you to enjoy.